<laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the heart of game? <laughs> the Shadow Snows. Hi, I'm The Shadow Snows and I'm here live at the Amiga 30 party in Neuss, Germany. With me uh, is Dave Haney, one of the original uh, developers of the Commodore Amiga. Uh, I hope you had a nice flight. Yeah, it was good. And how do you find uh, Neuf? It's What I've seen of it so far, it's great. I, I always enjoy going to Germany. I, I've spent more time here than anywhere, any other country but home. <laughs> uh, have you been uh, to Germany before? Yeah, I worked in, uh, I had a company called uh, um, call, called uh, Metabox in uh, Hildesheim for six years. Uh, I've heard about Metabox. Yeah. Not exactly sure what they do, but I've, I've heard about them. It, we, we started off, it, we, that Metabox was a spin out of, of uh, Amiga Technologies. It was, so all the people who were there were, were Amiga Technologies people. We, we, we were a startup. We, we wanted to make a new Amiga computer in 1995. We tried really hard. So Metabox was a, was a spin out of Amiga Technologies. We, we, were, we, we got a place in Hildesheim. And um, we were making, we were, we tried really hard to make a new Amiga. We tried to get the rights to the operating system. We just wanted what they called snapshot rights. You get, you get a copy of it. No more. You don't need support. You, 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 any changes we could give back to them? No, nope, nobody. Well, nobody really owned it. Was the problem after after SCOM? It was kind of in limbo for a while. So we ended up. We ended up, we, we talked to B for a little while and we ended up reselling B boxes, but they weren't going to port the operating system to anything. So we ended up making a Macintosh clone. Uh, was it an Amiga-based chipset? Uh, an evolution of the uh, AA chipset or completely new development? Um, it, was, it was a system. It was, we were using, we using off-the-shelf graphic chips at that point. Um, it was PowerPC-based. Um, the, the early stuff, basically what we did for, for the Macintosh clones, we bought motherboards from um, UMAX and we made our own PowerPC module. And then that's why we, we were the first company in the world to introduce a 300 megahertz Macintosh because we, we were making the boards. We were spending all our engineering effort just making the fast part, the part that was expensive and, and good. Um, I, was, I wasn't even doing that much of it. I was kind of working on the next generation of it, which was there was a standard called Chirp, sometimes called PPCP. I'm not a Macintosh okay. guy, so... Okay, it was, it was a standard for making motherboards, for making PowerPC-based computers that was going to be kind of like the way PCs are standard. This was going to be standard, so any, any operating system would run on them. Okay. And this was something that Apple, was propo that had Apple and, and Motorola and IBM had come up with. So I was working on that, which was the thing we called the Pius One. It was, it was, and it was designed, that was designed specifically for multimedia. It had, it had a CPU card, That you could so you could replace the CPU and the memory at the same time. It had a, a really good sound chip, so it could do 64 channels of MIDI or or audio, 64 audio channels. That was built in. We were still going to use off-the-shelf graphics chips because we just a little company can't go and make a graphics yeah, chip. Cool. So so that that was going to be our Macintosh clone that was really going to change the world. Except Apple decided that we couldn't make Macintosh clones anymore. So then we switched to set-top boxes. Uh, any clue if these uh, set-top boxes were sold or just developed? Um, some were, the, we had two different ones that were sold. There was the, the Metabox 100 was something that we OEM'd. We just bought it from somebody else. The Metabox 500 was all of our so our our develop our our environment, our software environment, and some special cards. But it was based on it was based on a very low-cost PC. And the Metabox 1000 was the one that we developed from scratch, both the operating system and the uh, and the hardware, and that's the one that never quite got released. Um, it was very Amiga-like. We wrote a kind of an updated version of Amiga OS. We hired Amiga developers to develop pieces for it. Like we had a uh, we had um, the Voyager web browser on it. We had MUI was our graphics toolkit. It was we were we were hiring we were getting as many Amiga people as possible involved throughout the world. Um, are there any uh, existing prototypes of this, or is there a YouTube video where I can look look it up? It, it, it sounds really interesting uh, to see it in operation. I, 
I'm not sure about video. It was video is not quite what it is today, where you have it on every cell phone. But um, there are prototypes around. I actually, I think I sold a couple uh, on, on eBay at one point, just because I had a bunch of, I had, I had like eight or ten of these things at home that really had no use anymore. Various different revisions. Um, part of the problem was the set-top box was a constantly changing thing, and every time I went to Germany, Mr. Domeyer, our CEO, was like. Dave, uh, there's a few more things I'd like to see in this set-top box, and I'm like, okay, Stefan, I'll put them in in the next revision. <laughs> yeah, the set-top box uh, business. We had one called the D-Box, which was, uh, and the D-Box 2, which was almost uh, a standard for 10 years, yeah. and it was uh, sold with a sub subscription for uh, our, our subscription channels. So I think uh, uh, third-party uh, set-top boxes were very scarce over here uh, anyways because you got the one bundled with the uh, subscription. Uh, yeah, another question. Uh, I think you are aware of the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think I, I like the idea of, of any, really any low-cost hardware, especially when it's sold at the board level, because that's getting people interested in hardware again. For a long time, people weren't interested that much in hardware. They were just doing software. And I think it's helped a lot that the things have become so cheap you don't necessarily have to develop the computer yourself, but you can think of like, what can I do with a $25 computer that's actually powerful enough to run a real operating system? I think they're really cool. Um, in fact, I have said many times, I wish there was an ARM version of Amiga OS because that would work perfectly on a Raspberry Pi. It would work even better on the computer I'd probably build because I'm working with ARM chips now. I know that technology. I could build a new uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd call it an Amiga, but I could build a new computer that ran Amiga OS. Just running Linux doesn't interest me. I'm not going to just go and make another Linux computer. There's plenty of those. <laughs> so you're not a Linux guy, or? It's, I, I mean, I know it. I've used it. I sometimes, if I'm going to write, if I'm going to write, pro, if I'm going to do any quick programming, I might use Linux. But it's not, you know, it doesn't really do anything for me. It's I un, I know all that's wrong with the whole U, way the Unix works compared to the way Amiga OS works. So. <laughs> I mean, it's just not that interesting. It's I, I the guys the guys who program my computers at where I'm working now are using Linux. It's it's everywhere. It's you know it, it's a good thing. It's just not my thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, you always get the plague. Microsoft Windows is the plague. Apple Apple is the plague, and Linux is another plague. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just choose your disease and stick with it. I think. You know, I, I mean, some some of it's you have to use a computer to get work done. So I have I have a really nice PC at home. It runs Windows because that's where all my CAD tools run. If my CAD tools ran on Linux, I'd probably be running Linux full time. If my CAD tools run in Macintosh, I might retire and become a musician or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm not I'm really not a Macintosh fan, but well, um, me either. But um, I, I I tried to be. If I was making if I had made a good business with Macintosh clones and Apple had kept it going, I would have become a Mac fan. I would have worked really hard to like it. <laughs> That's part of why I don't like it, by the way, is just that I, I'm spiteful because they tried to put my company out of business No, and it's, before it, we could put ourselves out of business. No, Macintosh is uh, just a, the whole Apple world is a closed system. Yeah. If you're in the Apple world, you're happy, but if you step outside for just right. a little bit, you're screwed. And there's a thing about it. When at Commodore, we did things differently because no one had done them before. If there was a really good way of like hooking a printer up to your computer, we used that good way. When there was not a good way of doing something, like auto configure, whatever, we made it up. Apple does stuff their own way just because they're Apple. Yeah. And that's annoying. They, we have to do it, we have to come out with this weird one button mouse because Steve says so. And you know, and and you know, and I mean, you know, the, okay, you know, the guy did revolutionize mobile devices, you, you know, but somebody had to kick those other people, uh, the people making PDAs before, or, you know, and, and smartphones before Apple got in the business were idiots and they weren't making very good ones. And I had one. I know exactly what, how stupid they you were. Mean the new I, I ha actually had a Palm. Oh. Palm wasn't bad, but I had a Treo and it was very, very limited, but it didn't need to be. This was, a, I mean, the processor that was in that Treo was the same processor that was in the um, the app, I mean, the Microsoft um, Zune. 
So it was capable, it, the MP3 and video player. So it was capable of playing video, it was capable of playing music. Palm didn't ship it with a video player. Like they didn't even understand what they had. The, 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 the Palm that I had had exactly the same size screen as the iPhone. But they didn't ship a video player with it and they didn't even allow it to run expansion memory properly. It was just like they had something that was great and they didn't know what to do with it. So it, bu it bugged me and it made me mad at them for being stupid. And they went out of business. <laughs> yeah. I can understand that uh, especially you as a, as a hardware developer, yeah. it must uh, drive you mad to know what this machine can do. And it just so can't because they don't. Done, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's talk a little bit about Amiga. Okay, good. Uh, I think, uh, uh, don't get me wrong, I love the original Amiga 1000, yeah. but I think it wasn't the right machine to be released. I think, uh, it's my opinion, and I'm, I don't think I'm alone with that, I think they should have uh, released the 2000 and the 500 right from the start. I think the uh, original Amiga 1000, uh, it was neither <laughs> professional enough to be uh, in the business, or cheap enough to be a home machine. What's your opinion about that? Um, I, it, you're right to an extent. I mean, the, the, the problem with the 1000 was it, it was really that it wasn't cheap enough. That because it wasn't cheap enough, the, the whole Commodore infrastructure didn't necessarily know what to do with it. Because that was just the way Commodore was. It was, it was really not a fault of the A1000. It was a fault of, the, of the, the whole support system that Commodore provided. You needed to have something that was a lot like a Commodore 64 if you wanted Commodore to do well with it. And, I mean, you, you saw the, 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 the presentation given earlier today here with, with, the, with, the, market, with the guys from the UK who, you know, they, they learned to sell things by understanding what it was they were selling. Commodore knew how to sell a gaming computer, so if you made a gaming computer, they could sell it, but it had to be in the same price range, it had to be sold through the same outlets. And they were all confused about how they were selling it. They were selling it through the wrong outlets, they were doing a lot of things that were wrong, and the professional systems, it was kind of the same thing, only the professional systems that sold really well in the US because we had the video toaster, that's because people knew what they wanted and went out and got it despite Commodore. Commodore wasn't really selling it, the Video Toaster was selling it. <laughs> and the sad thing that the uh, Video Toaster never got released in PAL regions. Yes. I, I would love to have one, honestly. That was a, that was a huge problem. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'd say it was a mistake because I'm not sure they had any choice. They had certain chips that worked a certain way and you know, they, if you can't get them, you can't get them and they weren't big enough at that time to commission a special part. But yeah, a PAL version of the of the toaster would have sold a whole lot more A2000s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think one of the Commodore's problems uh, in back in the days was uh, that Jack Tremel leave, uh, left Commodore, and uh, I call Commodore from that on like a headless chicken. They didn't know what they had, and they didn't know what to do with uh, what they had. Uh, one prime example is the Commodore 116. I don't know if you know the machine. Yeah, I know. I have a couple of those. They are quite abundant here in Germany and extremely rare elsewhere. Uh, I don't think it's a bad computer. They sold it for 99 bucks here yeah. with, a, uh, with a data set, right. all-inclusive bundle with some uh, training, so basic training software, and it sold like hotcakes. Yeah. Uh, the, the 116 was actually the computer that we were supposed to make with that TED chipset. I know. Yeah. The, the, if you don't know the story of the Plus 4, the 116, they were all based on the chip called the TED chip. The TED chip took, was basically a VIC chip plus a little bit of a SID chip. It did sound, it did graphics. It was, it was the answer because Jack Jamil was afraid of the Sinclair. Sinclair had a $100 computer and that scared the crap out of Jack because somebody was going to sell a cheaper computer than he could. And that never happened. Anytime somebody was selling a cheaper computer, he lowered the price. But he couldn't, he couldn't make a C64 sell for $100. So that was what the TED was supposed to be. And because of after Jack left, things got a little crazy and they started adding stuff to what was supposed to be a $100 computer and turned it into a $250 or $300 computer that was going head to head with the Commodore 64 where nobody else could compete with the Commodore 64. Atari failed and Apple failed at competing head-to-heads -head with it. Apple went for a different market. Atari just kind of went away, mostly. But the Plus 4 had no chance because it couldn't compete with the Commodore 64 either. But making a $100 computer like 
there was the C16, which they ultimately made, which was which was basically in the in the old Commodore 64 Vic case, f selling for about hundred dollars. And there was the 116, which was the original idea with the rubber keyboard, and that's that was the computer that was supposed to be. And, <laughs> Pretty sure if they sold that right away for a hundred bucks, it would have sold like hotcakes. And it was a useful amount of memory. It had 16K in it, I yeah, think. It was, I yeah. Preferred to have it, uh, 32 memories. The games would have yeah. been better, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Because if I if I look at the uh, Sigler Spectrum. And if I look at the Commodore uh, 116, the Spectrum can do better games despite of the uh, less powerful hardware. So yeah. it's just the memory. 16K is not enough to uh, do. Do some decent graphics. Better than 3K. <laughs> of course, better than 3K. <laughs> uh, and I think I have one final question. Which is your least favorite Amiga? Um, I would say my least favorite Amiga is the Amiga 600. And that's because that was one of those sort of like what happened with the 116 versus the plus four. The Amiga 600 was supposed to be the Amiga 300. It's supposed to be cheaper than a 500 by quite a bit. It's supposed to be the thing that brought you in to the Amiga universe. And we had management change and decide that was going to be everything. So they threw all this extra stuff in there and ended up costing more than the A500. Nobody wanted it, so they canceled the A500, which was still selling. Possibly the only time in Commodore history that a good selling computer was canceled. And it was just it was a it was a total mess and it was it was sort of i mean there's nothing that wrong with a with an a600 all by itself it's just it's a fine computer it's just that because of the the politics behind it and what it meant at the company that you know the wrong people were calling the shots makes me not like it <laughs> yeah i know it's it's highly sought after right now because it has the pcmcia slot yeah. you can uh, attach a network de uh, device it has the uh, ide port yeah. where you can uh, use a compact flash card yeah. and I'm having trouble with all my Amiga 600 because none of them work so it's my least favorite uh, Amiga 2. Uh, were you involved in the development of this or completely? No, it was, um, it was mostly George Robbins. George Robbins had done the 300 and he was getting charged to, to add the stuff to it so I, I and I'm uh, Brian Fenimore may have worked on it. I'm not sure if he was. <clears throat> Brian Fenimore had started out as a as a lab tech, got his engineering degree, and then became one of our one of our low end engineers too. I was doing the high end stuff, and at that point, I was like, I was off in Never Neverland working on double A chips and triple A chips, and and trying, you know, just trying to basically build, get all these all these chip des new chip designs up and running, so we could figure out if they worked or not and make products out of them. I wasn't actually working on the products. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's, I think, what makes the Amiga such a great machine. Uh, the people who worked on it didn't do it as a job. They did it as a passion, I think. Oh, yeah. I think that's the reason why this is such an awesome machine. And we have 400 or 500 people uh, right here in a small town in Germany celebrating the 30th yeah. anniversary of it. And uh, on, on my live stream, I have uh, dozens of people who uh, said, Oh, I would have liked to come, but I could not because uh, when I checked, all the tickets were sold out. So it's still huge. It's one of the hugest uh, uh, milestones in computing. In, in, to me, to be honest, it's a gaming console. The Amiga for me was always a gaming console which I could do computing stuff on, right. and that was great. As a teenager, uh, <laughs> you want. I, I watched the first porn on the Amiga because it looked so much better than on a Commodore 64, what teenage boys just do. Yeah. At oh, the yeah. age of 13, 14, 15, you watch porn on the computer. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> we did. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, as I was saying on stage today, it's completely 100% unreasonable for somebody like me who's doing electronics to expect you to remember what I did four years ago, much less 20 or 30. So, I mean, it's just, you know, I come here and I'm like, I get all, you know, I get all teary and misty because it's like, oh, wow, people, you know, people love these things that we wanted them to, but, you know, we, you know, people move on. I mean, you know, you're not using the camcorder that you bought 10 years ago and you're not using the phone that you bought five years ago and all. So the fact that you're, you know, that Amigas are still understood and well known and people love them, you know, it's great. I mean, you, you, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, I, that says more about 
what I think I did then than I could ever put into words. <laughs> it was an important part of my childhood and I think a lot of others here. Yeah. It, it played an important role. It, me, the Amiga didn't bring me to computers. It was the Commodore 64 three years earlier. Yeah. But the Amiga made me stay at it. Because it was a useful computer, you could do any, anything with it, and it was an awesome console. It was yeah, I think, I think that was a good part of it too, is that you could do whatever you wanted to with it. You could write music on it, you could play music on it, you could play video games on it, you could write books on it, you could make a movie on it. No, there had not been a computer that would do all of those things before. And I've done all of those things on it. Even the porn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember my, my first retracing job, just a, a metal ball on a, on a grid, and it took, I think it took two days to render. But it was an Amiga, it, it looked great afterwards, and yeah. I've never seen such things before. And oh yeah, you, we, were, we were putting, I, did, I designed circuit boards on the Amiga. We were putting tools in the hands, we meaning the whole community, because we had all these people writing great software. When, when, I, when I'm done with something, it sits there and generates heat. It doesn't do anything. Then I give it to the software guys and they make the operating system alive on it. And then it sits there and maybe does a nice boing ball and generates heat. It isn't until the software developers come along and make it really do something, but you know that's why you come to something like this and you see, wow, well, look what you did with that 20-year-old computer that I'm still amazed. Even today I'm amazed that, you know, that something that I did is doing that now, something I was involved with. Um, because because we, we, I think we also tended, because it was a computer that could do all these different things, we tended to get people who were not one issue people. We got the creative people. We got people who could, who could look at that computer and say, I imagine doing this other thing, and I know I can do it on this computer rather than somebody else's. So, I mean, I think it was, there was a, a real synergy between the community and the developers. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, like myself and, you know, and RJ and, and um, you know, a bunch of, our, of us others, stayed in contact with the community after Commodore, during Commodore, we were answering questions late at night because we wanted, you know, because that gave, if, if I'm making something, I'm, I'm making a new computer, I'm making it for you and you and you, um, I want to know what you want. And we didn't have a marketing department that functioned and said, this is what they want, so we had to kind of figure it out. <laughs> to be honest, it's not a bad thing to to not have a marketing department which uh, tells you what to do, or or would you love to uh, work for a marketing department? Um, it's not so much working for a marketing department. If I knew that I had a marketing department that could figure out what our sales department were able to sell, and then they would go and sell it, that's a whole lot better than just guessing. Because we're still going to put in there what we want. <laughs> we just want to make sure that they're getting what they want too because they have to be able to sell it. That's like when, when the, the UK guys were saying we wanted the A300 because we knew how to sell it. They didn't get the A300. They got something that actually hurt their business <laughs> when the A600 came out. And it was because, first, mostly it was because it was called the A600. People expected it was going to be better. And it was... It was for an Amiga, I mean, it had features the A500 didn't have, but for an Amiga, it didn't have any, it wasn't faster, it wasn't cheaper, it, there was no reason for it. So, you know, the, a marketing, you know, those guys had marketing people. They knew what they could sell, they just didn't get it. Okay, now, one final question that comes into my mind. Uh, what, what was your experience with uh, the German department of Commodore in Braunschweig? Um, I always had a good time with the Germans. I mean, they, we, you know, I didn't do a lot of projects with the Braunschweig engineers. They were doing things like the bridge board. I did tell a story about the the. I think you did the story in yeah. Instagram about the original Amiga 2000. I think. Yeah, yeah, because I well, you know, and that was that was one of those things where they had they had made the they made the A2000 mostly because they because of the bridge card because they wanted a place to put the bridge card to build a, a PC inside an Amiga. And it just so happened that 
I mean, it, you know, like I said, it was an ugly, it's a really ugly computer, but at least it has a soul. <laughs> but it, I mean, it, it, is, it is kind of ugly, but it was very functional too. If, with, if there was no 2000, there would not have been a video toaster. There, there, and all this other stuff that plugged inside. So I mean, it, there were some very good decisions made there. It just wasn't very beautiful. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have any problem with the Germans. They, they had done what they needed to deliver that so that they could get the so they could start work on the on the bridge card, and I took it over and you know and applied all the new technology to it to make it cheaper and and enhanced, more reliable, enhanced because it did other things. It, it had the CPU card you could plug in and had the full video slot that we just came up with one afternoon. I was looking at the video slot, which they were thinking was just a Genlock slot, and I said we need to run eight more bits of video there because we only had four, we had four bits that the four bits of video you'd use if you used an old-fashioned Digital monitor, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but the, the, there was there were three lines, of, four lines of digital video that went there, that were for like a Commodore, like a Commodore 128 monitor. You never really want to run your Amiga on a Commodore 128 monitor, but you could. Don't know anybody no. who ever tried that. But well, they they had put the the original 1000 had that had put that on there because that was a popular kind of monitor back then. No one ever used it that way, but you could. So I said, well, we need the other the other eight bits so we can all have all 12 bits of our video on that card on that slot. And George Robbins, who of course was the 500 guy, but he was also my kind of my advisor when I was working on the on the 2000, since he designed the 500 stuff, and he was a month or two ahead of me on the design. And he would say, he said, well, let's just run a parallel port over there. So signals from one of the CIA chips went over there so you could make it do stuff, right? So that's what made a video toaster possible the way it was done. So, you know, <coughs> not something we were expecting. Okay, then I uh, want to thank you for the interview and I hope to see you uh, again in 10 years when we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Amiga. I'll be here. Okay, thank you.